Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> My name is John Russell. I am an attorney by trade. I'm licensed in three states, wanted in several more. <clears throat> uh, the last time I was up here, it was last August, 2023, and I was uh, teaching out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. We saw Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in humility, riding on a donkey as the king of peace, fulfilling all the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. But he turned out not to be the kind of king the people of Israel expected. This was because these prophecies included the Gentiles and foreigners as part of the kingdom, ethnic groups the Jewish people despised. We saw that Jesus got angry about this. He cleared the temple of the merchants to literally make room for these outsiders, and he cursed the fig tree, which represented the religious leaders and connected the tree's failure to produce fruit to this bigotry. The Palm Sunday scene and Christ's intentions for his people culminate in the vision from Revelation 7-9, where we see a picture of heaven at the end of time, revealing every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne waving palm branches and worshiping together, showing that true diversity within the church is a gift from God, a foundational part of his plan, and arguably Christ's highest calling for his people. Recall that I also suggested that the culmination of Christ's death and resurrection is not just an individual salvation, vital as that is, but also to see all of those individuals join together in the assembling of a people the preparation of Christ's bride. God's purposes are more universal than we realize. The Bible begins with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But evangelical and Protestant Christians tend to start God's narrative history with the story from Genesis chapter 3, focusing on the fall of humanity, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and mankind was cursed by sin. Their worldview focuses on God's redemptive mission. It's all about saving a lost world. I believe this is because these groups primarily built their theology on the books of Romans and Galatians, where such concepts are central. On the other hand, there's other Christian groups, like the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox, who have built their theology on the Synoptic Gospels, and they produced a focus on obedience. Now, there's nothing wrong with either emphasis. Both viewpoints are crucial, but by themselves, I think that they are incomplete. And I'd like to suggest a slight change of focus for us, that we begin not with the needs of sinful humanity, but with the intent and purpose of God. What if our point of departure was not the earth after the fall, but the eternal activity within the triune Godhead prior to creation, before the constraints of physical time? And we find such an outlook in the book of Ephesians, where we get a clearer view of the mission of the gospel and the purpose of the church that begins not with the needs of humans after the fall, but with God's timeless purposes before creation. And that includes the same vision for unity and diversity that we saw last time in Mark chapter 11. I believe understanding this ageless purpose will give us a new and exciting perspective on our relationship with God and with each other. Now, the historical focal point of Christianity has been to get people right with God. I think sometimes the church fails to move past the concept that mankind has a need for a Savior. Now, I'm not saying this isn't vitally important and foundational. We all fall short of God's glory, and we cannot attain a oneness with God without the saving power of Jesus. But once we have salvation, what is next? The focus often stays on us and the other needs of mankind. Sometimes we care for those needs selflessly through acts of service for others. But I think too often we get caught up in keeping the focus on ourselves and selfishly trying to meet our own needs. I believe we need to focus less on the needs of mankind and more on the eternal purpose of God. And I'd like to begin in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And there Paul says... Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. 
Now let's unpack that for a minute. Paul is praising God for giving us every spiritual blessing in Christ. And why? Because he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Now stop right there and think about that. Before the world existed, God had a plan, and that plan included all of us. I'm not used to this response. That's amazing. <laughs> now, the Greek word here for creation means laying a foundation or establishing something that is vast and solid and lasting for a long time. But the Greek word for world here is more exciting. It's bigger than the earth we live on. The word is literally cosmos. Modern English defines cosmos as the universe seen as a well-ordered whole. The ancient Greeks used, to refer to a, used it to refer to a harmonious arrangement in the world around us, particularly referring to the sky, the arrangement of the stars, or the heavenly hosts. So I think when Paul says, before the creation of the world, he really means before the creation of the universe. Now this exact phrase, before the creation of the world, only appears two other times in the New Testament. One is in 1 Peter 1.20 where Peter is speaking of Jesus and says, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. This implies foreknowledge, that before creation in the farthest regions of eternity past, God planned for Christ to be connected to us today as our Redeemer. The second verse is John 17, 24, where Jesus is praying for his disciples at the Last Supper, and he says, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Now, these verses show us that Jesus exists eternally. He has no beginning. He co-created the world with the Father when there was already a plan for him to be our bridge to the Father, and this was all happening before the world was made. But in Ephesians 1.4, this phrase that is otherwise applied only to Jesus now includes us as part of the pre-creation plan. But it doesn't mean we literally existed prior to creation. The phrase, in him, is the key. Paul uses some variant of in him or in Christ nine times in the first 14 verses of Ephesians. Jesus is the agent for making all things new. In Christ, the world is finally set right. But this also speaks to the reality that believers have now changed their address. They've been incorporated into Christ. We're not just loved, we're not just saved, but God has brought us into Jesus. We have a new location on the cosmic map. We exist in Christ. This is a fundamental change in our identity. It's a new range of options for relationships, thought, speech, behavior, and the very trajectory of our lives. God set this reality into motion before he made the world. Was there foreknowledge of our salvation? Well, yes, but the goal was much more profound. God means for us all to live together. It says, holy and blameless, in verse 4, assimilated and fused into Jesus in the heavenly realms. In a cosmic sense, it's like moving into a new dimension. Now, it's not in the future. All these verbs are in present tense. This reveals that before the world began, God's master plan was for all believers, indeed all ethnicities, to live together in a communal concept of diversity starting now and lasting into eternity. And as we go through these early chapters of Ephesians, we ultimately see the culmination of this cosmic plan for diversity in Ephesians 3, verse 10. And there it says, God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Now, God's intention is made known through the church, it says, not just an individual. It's been said, if you were the only person alive on the earth, Jesus would have still died for you. Well, there's truth in this, but logic requires more expansiveness. Christ's redemption culminates in the entirety of his redeemed people. That is, the company of the saints, the children of God, the bride of Christ. So I'd like to look at some of the highlights from Ephesians chapter 3 with a view to comprehending the cosmic mission of the church. 
Excuse me a minute. We're going to start in verse 2. It says, Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which, is not, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I became a servant of this gospel, we'll skip down to verse 9, to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Back in Ephesians chapter 1, we were introduced to the cosmic nature of God's eternal purposes, and here Paul explains the cosmic mission. And I'd like to um, unpack Ephesians 3, verse 10. And we're going to answer three, three questions today. Number one, who are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? Number two, what is the manifold wisdom of God? And number three, how is the church going to make the manifold wisdom known? So let's look at question number one. Who are these rulers and authorities? The King James Version translates this in a way that may be more familiar to most of us as principalities and powers. The original Greek phrase is a series of words that incorporates the word cosmos, and it implies political power on a global scale, and the ancient Greeks almost always used these words to refer to Satan and the forces of evil. We see this in Ephesians 6.12 where it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Here, these rulers and authorities are clearly aligned with everything that's dark and evil in the world. They are not flesh and blood. That is, they are not human. They are supernatural beings. Paul identifies their location as being in heavenly realms, which literally means the spheres above the earth, This may seem confusing because Paul has already placed both Jesus and God's people in heavenly realms in Ephesians chapter 1, but this isn't about geography. It just means these evil forces are not earthly, but inhabit another dimension, and it happens to be the same one occupied by God and his angels. Therefore, we have to conclude that the rulers and authorities in Ephesians 3.10 are Satan and his demonic angels. And they have a cosmic influence on our world, and they seek to destroy the kingdom of God. So the second question is, what is this manifold wisdom the church is to make known to the rulers and authorities? Well, to figure this out, there are three stages of revelation in Ephesians 3. 3. First, Paul receives revelation from God. That's verses 2 through 7. Second, the church receives revelation from Paul, verses 8 and 9. And third, the church makes this revelation known to the rulers and authorities, verse 10. I'd like to map each stage, and we're going to see revelation in each case. All right, first, Paul hears from God. In verse 3, Paul says that the mystery was made known to me by revelation. What is this mystery? In verse 4, it's called the mystery of Christ. Then verse 5 tells us in what sense it's mysterious, and verse verse 6 tells us what the content of the mystery is. It is mysterious, according to verse 5, in the sense that it was not made known to people before in the way that it has now been revealed to the apostles and prophets through the Spirit. What is it? Verse 6 says the revealed mystery is that in Christ Jesus and through the gospel, the Gentiles are now fellow heirs with Israel members of the same body, sharers in the same promise. That's the big deal. In Old Testament times, Israel was God's chosen people. They alone received the unique benefits of God's covenant, the promises, the law, the temple worship. Now, God did say that through Israel, the nations, that is the Gentiles, would be blessed. That's Genesis 12. But this isn't spelled out clearly in what sense or to what degree. Jewish people in the Old Testament were not paying attention 
to the prophetic hints that God intended to include all the nations in the blessings promised to Israel. So when Jesus came to accomplish just that, many in Israel simply rejected him. But it is clear that Christ came for that purpose. Romans 15 verse 8 says, I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. This is the mystery and truth revealed to Paul, and I discussed it when we looked at Jesus cursing the fig tree. Contrary to most Jewish expectations, Jesus came to save both Jew and Gentile and to join them both into one new people who together inherit the promises, and this today is the church. Now, Paul uses imagery from the practices of the temple to explain this, making a connection to what Jesus did in Mark 11 when he drove out the merchants. I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 12. It says, Remember that at that time you Gentiles were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to, Father, to the Father by one spirit. In Mark 11, Jesus cleared the merchants from the temple to make room for the Gentiles to occupy the only space in the temple where they were already allowed to be, and that's within the court of the Gentiles. At the time Paul is writing the letter of Ephesians, he's in prison because he was falsely charged with taking a non-Jew into the inner courts of the temple. That's in Acts chapter 21. As we discussed last time, taking a non-Jew inside the boundary of the court of the Gentiles was punishable by death. The Ephesians undoubtedly knew why Paul was in prison. Thus, for them, as well as for Paul, there can be no greater symbol of the barrier between Jew and non-Jew than the dividing wall of hostility that literally existed in the temple and figuratively kept Jews and Gentiles apart. But Paul says here that that dividing wall is shattered in Christ. Then going on in verses 19 through 22, Paul speaks of all the dividing walls coming down. In verse 21, he describes the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. But in the next verse, he says it's God's people who are being built together to become a dwelling where God lives. Therefore, this mystery Paul received is in Christ's death he purchased not just eternal life for individuals in salvation who trust him, but he formed a new people, a church composed of Jews and Gentiles who are both heirs of God's promises and beneficiaries of God's grace. This is stage one of our revelation here in Ephesians chapter 3. The second stage of the revelation is that Paul preaches this good news to the nations that the Gentiles may become fellow heirs of Israel's promise by simply trusting in Christ. And now that this truth has been made known to these Gentiles, and they're fully part of this new unified church, the third stage of Revelation happens in verse 10. And again, that says, through the church, and that is through this new group of unified people, the manifold wisdom of God will now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. Indeed, the word manifold means many and various. The Greek word translated as manifold comes from a word used to describe artwork that contained a great variety of colors. It is a perfect adjective to help us understand that the highest purpose of God, his true intent, was to bring together people of every color and ethnicity to be woven and built into the eternal temple. That is God's kingdom. And that leaves us with one final question. How are we the church to make this wisdom known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms? Excuse me again. 
Well, I'll tell you what. The wisdom of God's plan is seen by the fact that it works. We reveal the manifold wisdom of God by showing that the church, showing in the church, that the death of Jesus was not in vain, that it has reconciled us to God, and it also has broken down the wall of hostility, not just between Jew and Gentile, but between all the other races, all the other ethnic groups, between all divisions in society, between the rich and the poor, between all the different denominational groups, even between Democrats and Republicans. It has produced one new body and it has given us the hope of his immeasurable kindness forever. We show the wisdom of God to those cosmic powers by living this way, by being the church Christ died to create. Now to me, this is an amazingly exciting concept. Each of us, no matter who we are, has an amazing, incredible calling. It stretches our imaginations to the limit. It sets our minds on all these unseen, stupendous, heavenly realities. This is where the focus on just saving people and rescuing a lost world, and important as that is, needs to be adjusted a bit. Each of us, as a redeemed child of God, has been gifted with a unique, God-given ability to dispense grace and strengthen faith. Now, you might feel small and insignificant, but because you are part of God's eternal plan, and I mean eternal plan going back to before the creation of the world, your mere existence takes on stupendous proportions. How stupendous? Well, in the gospel it says that we are the light of the world. But here in Ephesians we discover we're the light of the cosmos, the light of the universe. The church is the cosmic showcase of God's mercy. Now, the sad reality is the church has historically failed to live up to this. We remain divided racially and culturally because of bigotry, ignorance, and fear. This brings a cosmic reproach upon the manifold wisdom of God. But what if that changed? And what if that changed starting right here with us? Now, I just want you all to look around the room. I want you to take it in. Look at the amazing ethnic and cultural diversity that's on display here. This is just like... This is just like Pastor Ozzie Smith said last week. We've got the black and the white keys. They're all in place. We just have to start making the music, folks. We have the perfect laboratory for how to prove God's manifold wisdom works. Besides the obvious racial and ethnic diversity, many of us come from a wide variety of denominations and faith traditions, and there's socioeconomic diversity here in abundance. But finally, there is this wonderful subset of people, and we got to see a little bit of that before I came up here, that gives our church this truly unique flavor, and that's all of you folks from Restoration Ministries. You give us a slice of society that I dare say is found in no other church. I know. So we're all called to walk together. Just like Ozzie Smith said, you know, we're we're here to make that beautiful music. But we're not just to get along or just be friends. We're called to demonstrate to Satan and his hosts that we are a family. We are one undivided and unified church. Now, what's this going to mean? Our intercession is going to change. We will continue to pray for salvation. We'll continue to pray for healing, but also for the fulfillment of this specific calling of God. Each person in the church has a role. The way we relate to each other is going to change. We must show greater sensitivity to each other to avoid misunderstandings and injury, but yet we need to recognize that we're all human, and when such injuries occur... We need the grace to forgive and heal the breach and the bond of peace. Of course, we've known that all along, but now we understand it has cosmic significance. And what a time to have this revelation. We've experienced this huge wave of new people coming into the church, families joining with those of us who have been here for years and years. Many of us are hurting, coming to God for healing and for answers. 
Many of us just want more from the Lord and to get closer from Him, closer to Him. But there's something different. You can feel it. There's something new. And I think it's because we've begun to realize this cosmic mission. There's a deepening of God's call on our lives. We are more interconnected, whether it's in our connect groups or Bible studies or other outreaches. We are finding rejuvenation, revival, and deeper relationships. We need to put this in perspective. It's all part of the spectacular purpose of celebrating our shared relationship as a diverse, unified people that is fulfilling God's eternal purpose. Plus, guess what? We still meet everybody's individual needs as well. There's also something in this for me, personally, and perhaps for others like me, who've been part of Spirit of God Fellowship for a long, long time. Some of the changes that have happened have left me feeling hurt and heartbroken. People I've walked with closely and loved dearly have left our church. I have felt empty when concepts and traditions that meant so much to me were changed or ceased to be. Now, last year, Pastor Brian shared his vision for the church, and he told the story of the reconstruction of the temple from Ezra chapter 3. And I want to read that verse. It says, Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads, old-timers, who had seen the former temple, wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise. Like the older exiles who remembered the glorious past of the temple that had been destroyed, I think saga of old-timers like me sometimes mourn for what once was. And I begin to ask God, I asked him, you know, why do I struggle with this? And in light of the message I'm presenting to you this morning, perhaps what's happening is the product of when a church actually demonstrates the manifold wisdom to the rulers and authorities. This is truly spiritual warfare. I shouldn't be surprised when the demonic forces who oppose the wisdom of God start to fight back. Satan's guerrilla war tactics seek to sinisterly divide us. And people like me need to realize this is truly spiritual war. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're not fighting against people. It's so easy for me to conclude the other person is wrong for how they reacted or how they reacted. And if I take up that offense, then I'm playing right into Satan's hands. Satan disguises his efforts to divide us. He wraps it up in our own self-righteousness and self-importance. Believers who engage in willful sin... Well, they might try to make an excuse for what they do, but deep down, I think they know that they're doing wrong. But what happens when somebody offends me? I'll tell you what, I feel righteous indignation. I revel in it. It's because I'm right, they're wrong. And I want justification. I have a big problem letting that go. But I need to repent of that mindset because Ephesians 3.10 shows us that it's the unity of a diverse church that's the ultimate weapon in spiritual war. When we're defining what spiritual warfare is, it says in 2 Corinthians 10.4, we don't wage war as the world does, but with divine power to demolish strongholds. But we can't brazenly bring Satan down by our own strength. That verse about demolishing strongholds is followed by Paul describing the details of demolishing arguments and every pretension and taking captive every thought for Christ. So it's not about spiritual gunslinging or conquering territory, but changing and renewing our minds. There's no aggression. There's only submission. When I'm offended... I tend to rush in and I'm binding demons and I'm swinging a spiritual sword without understanding what's going on or what the other person's motives are. But it's not about proving who's right and who's wrong. Ephesians 3 makes it clear that our unity and diversity is the ultimate weapon. It's like taking a nuclear bomb and setting it off in the cosmos. We don't even have to do anything. Uh, The only way this is accomplished is in humility and repentance by laying down our lives for each other. Jesus is calling us to walk in the essence of this mission in lowliness and meekness 
with patience, forbearing one another in love, eager, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.3, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So when Jesus cursed the fig tree and drove the merchants from the temple, he demonstrated to us that diversity was his highest goal, affirming the messianic prophecies that all nations were part of God's plan. This shocked the Jewish people who always thought the kingdom was just for them. In Ephesians, we see that this plan for diversity has been God's agenda all along since before creation. Paul defines it as a mystery, and it's radical, and it's scandalous, because the world believes it's impossible for all these different groups to ever get along. But Christ tore down the wall of hostility, bringing these formerly incompatible groups together in his love. So, my brothers and sisters, we need to purposefully unite against fear and ignorance and prejudice and stand together to overcome all of these offenses that divide us. You see, God has always intended that the unification of this impossibly incompatible people would be the ultimate weapon in spiritual warfare. Now, it's a cosmic win-win. We experience salvation, we come into God's kingdom, and we receive the healing and the joy and the fulfillment of being part of the family of God forever, and Satan gets crushed. Now, I ask you folks, what could possibly be better? Thank you so much for letting me share.